Welcome back to the Rules of Engagement. Before I jump into our third segment, let me remind you guys, if you're interested in, in maybe a potential career in game design or the esports industry, go ahead and think about Full Seal University. Go to www.fullseal.edu slash MLG to find more information on the programs in, in video production, 3D animation, game design, audio engineering, uh, all these really cool skill sets that if you really want to get a job in the game design industry, you got to get the education. Full Seal University is one option. Why not you get some more information on that option if it's something you might be interested in? www.fullsale.edu slash MLG for more information on their different educational programs. Our third segment is going to be on a Zerg vs. Protoss, uh, kind of a, a low-tech style of play, a very mass roach heavy. So we'll talk about some of this low-tech Zerg play, and then we'll talk from the Protoss perspective how to set up that optimal defense and also how to deal with the mass roaches. So we'll start us out at the 7.30 mark. Uh, and one thing we've... we've uh, can kind of already see here a little bit is the Zerg's not taking lair. He's getting speed and Roachworm before lair, which is actually pretty rare for high level Zerg to do this unless their opponent's doing a gateway all in. Um, and of course, he, I think he's seen the, yeah, he's seen the Nexus. So there's no reason to get all these investments. He knows he doesn't actually need them to, to defend an attack because it's not an attack coming um, besides like a little stalker house. What he's doing though is he's saying, I don't want lair tech. I'm going to try the, this low tech style play, even getting a fourth hatchery. Uh, before lair tech. Of course, the fourth hatchery isn't really um, for Econ right now. It's potentially get droned up later. It's more just for the larva, and he said, you know what? Why not build the force so I can do some drone explosion a little bit later if I need to? So, one thing to consider if you're doing this style of play that he's doing right now, um, this lower tech style, what you really want to do, if you're going to build, build all these roaches and speedlings, you have to try to force trades. If you just sit around on roaches and speedlings, and then even if you might have an economic advantage, your opponent also has a bunch of sentries in Colossal or they have like 30 Void Rays or something like that, like you're just going to die. It doesn't matter how much money you have, your, your units are all useless. So if you're going to invest on these low-tech units, especially as Zerg, but as other races too, um, you want to try to force trades that will basically make your opponent have to constantly, constantly, constantly rebuild their low-tech units. So even if they have a robotics facility, they can't feel comfortable throwing down a support bay in a second robotics facility because they have to build more gateways and more cannons, warp more units in, or they're going to die to all these low-tech uh, units. And if you keep trading and trading and trading, if your trades are decent, you can kind of grind them out by forcing them to stay on low-tech. So not from the Protoss perspective. I mean, he's, he's seen his attack coming. He had a hallucination that went over there and spotted everything. And so if you're on Daybreak as a Protoss, right, let's actually just bring up the map and, and talk about it a bit. So you're Daybreak as a Protoss. You need to defend three locations from this Mass Roach play. You don't have that many units because your Protoss on three bases They're early on. You're not going to have a lot of units compared to Zerg. So you need to defend that base, you need to defend this base, and of course you need to defend your main base as well. As it wasn't a very good drawing. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to find the locations that, one, allow you mobility between your two bases ideally. Uh, sometimes Some maps you can't do that. Some maps you just have to say, okay, we're going to defend this base and this base separately, right? But on, on, on Daybreak, one thing you can do is you can say, you know what, this here is not any easier to defend than this. So let's just scratch that out. Don't defend there. And if I can just make, um, let's actually use a little eraser function. If I can just defend these two areas right here, right, that area and this area, they're both pretty short or easy to defend tactically. They're close to all my bases. All right, I, I can move between them. And importantly, they're, they're close to my side of the map, right? You never want to be in a map where like, you know what the smallest choke point to defend is going to be like right here, right? And I can defend that. No, because it's just you, trying to get units out there is going to be real pain. Uh, and you just have to defend. You don't have to, def to hold the whole map. You just have to hold your three bases. So pick the two closest locations. Don't do anything crazy like that. No, that's, that's not good. Just the two closest locations that allow you mobility between your bases and where you can defend tactically with minimal force fields. So that, that's kind of what you want to do. Uh, um, Hansing is, is kind of saying, you know what? I have a wall here. I don't want to build another wall there, and, and I'm just going to defend here. No, that's okay. I mean, I, I would have liked to see these gateways probably out here if he knew that the Mass Orchard is coming, which he did. Uh, but this is still playable. You can still play this defense. But when you play this defense where you defend two locations, the things you have to make sure are, one, have tons of sentries at either location. Right? Either location makes you have tons of sentries. And then two, be very patient. Time's on your side. Right? As, as your sentries, every second that passes, your sentries get more powerful, whereas their units don't get any more powerful. They're, they're, they're like, they don't benefit from sitting around. Sentries gain more energy when you sit around so they get stronger. So time's on your side, not only because their sentries get more energy, 
but also you're building more efficient units, right? You're adding in immortals. You're adding in more and more sentries and stalkers, and they can only add in roaches and speedings, which aren't going to be that efficient. So make sure you, uh, you just stay very patient, very defensive, stay behind all your walls and buildings. From the Zerg point of view, try to burn, burn out the force fields and try to focus key structures. So for example, the Psychor, very important. And that's why Huan Singh already anticipated dying, has already started rebuilding one, because it's super, super important. The Zerg player, always go for that Psychor if you can. If they can't build sentries and stalkers, they can only warp in zealots, you're happy. Because that, that's like I was saying, the whole idea is you force them to make low-tech units. Ideally, you, you prevent them from building this, uh, you know, the support bay, more robos. But even a step beyond that is preventing them from building sentries and stalkers and just zealots. Because all of a sudden, if they're building zealots, you're actually going to be the one being more cost-efficient. Because roaches are slightly cost-efficient against zealots. So, great trade for you. Um, and, and you have to keep engaging. Right? Uh, as Ghost Teacher, he can't back away and be happy because his opponent, if he backed away right now and was happy, look at how many, there's 13 sentries. A minute from now when there's four mortals and these 13 sentries each have, you know, 18 force fields, that's something like, you know, um, what was it, 200 or something force fields. Well, they wouldn't really have 18 each, but um, you get the idea. There's a ton of force fields and a ton of immortals. Not a situation you want to fight in as a Zerg player who's just on roaches. Even if he's not going to have roach speed, it's still not a situation he wants. So he's committed himself to doing this aggression. You have to keep trading. Uh, and as a Protoss player, you just want to stay back and defensive. If he just keeps the units back and keeps warping the sentries at both sides, you know, three force fields can wall off here, you know, three to four, depending on, on uh, how many buildings fall down, can wall off this section. All of a sudden, he'll just get unstoppable army once a few more mortals get out. But when you walk out like this, right, all of a sudden, this is, this is a really, really, really bad position for the Protoss, right? And it can kind of look cool, right? Right here kind of looks cool because you're thinking, you know what? The Zerg player can't really attack me very well. I've got good force fields. It's good, right? But you have to think about this. Um, even, even if this battle went well, if he waited for two more mortals, it would go better. And with only one immortal, or sorry, he has two immortals. With only two immortals and only one stalker, he, the damage output isn't very high. The effectiveness of sentries can be measured this simple. Or effectiveness of force fields. How good are your force fields on trapping units and preventing your own units from dying multiplied by how much damage you have behind those force fields to kill all the units before the force fields go away? Because you could have the perfect force fields ever with your sentries, but then if you only had like five sentries and you like trap a whole bunch of roaches and you realize, okay, I trapped them, now what? I can't kill them? It's not as good. With two immortals, you can get a couple kills, but it's still not as efficient as if he waited. Time's on his side. Going out like this is dangerous. And the biggest reason why it's dangerous is because think about what happens when he has to retreat. Where's, where's the retreat path, right? He has to jam all the units down this way. And, and trying to squeeze these this amount of units down that way it's, it's not, it's not going to go well, right? What's going to happen is there's going to be two guys go through the door, and the other five are going to get stuck there. That's why they tell you don't panic when the fire alarm is pulled, because if everyone panics and they'll try to jam through a small area, which is what happens if we just move commander units, a couple will get through and the rest keep bumping into each other. Meanwhile, these roaches will come forward and kill them all. So uh, a very, very tough situation here, and there's really no need to, to walk out in the map, because, again, time's on his side. He's, he's getting a tech advantage. As a Protoss opponent, the one thing that's a little scary is you don't have much map vision, right? So, like, what if he's doing a mass meter switch? So what you do is if you, if you don't see constant roaches streaming in, just send a hallucination out, right? Yes, it's 100 energy, but it's better to use 100 energy out of your 13 centuries than it is to use 200 energy, 250, 300 energy, and then also be losing units, right? Because he's already lost two centuries pushing out here. He's going to lose another three centuries and more stalkers. I'm trying to get back here. He, he lost, uh, yeah, he lost three sentries, a couple stalkers, and he lost a ton of sentry energy. Whereas if he just did hallucination to confirm his opponent was still going roaches, all of a sudden this army would have a lot more forcefuls and units, and now could move out and fight these roaches, right? See, right here, the great defensive force fields, if he could be more confident to move out right then and trap him on the other side with force fields, he might have one game. Or even just hanging back now and just consistently using those force fields to keep the roaches back. Unfortunately, because he ran out of force fields, he, you know, he does, basically doesn't have any more. Roaches come in, and they're just going to kill everything here. We'll just fast forward through the end of it. Roaches are going to focus on this Nexus. Then they're going to get bored trying to go into the main. They're just going to walk up here, and they're going to focus on this Nexus too. So uh, that's going to be the, the game right here as they focus on Nexus. Juan Singh's going to stick around for a couple minutes because he's, he's like frustrated at losing to mass roaches. Um, but the thing that a really key moment that decided that game was the moment he walked out 
and lost three centuries, lost 300 force field energy, and only killed like five or six roaches, or even if it was 10 roaches. But it was, you can't afford to use those force fields like that. All you have to do is sit back and wait, and if you don't die, you win. It's that simple, because your opponent just has pure roaches. Once you get up to about 130 food, if it's all century immortal for the most part, you just automatically win. Um, well, you automatically win if you're at this level of play and you can hit good force fields in a battle. Um, so obviously that's something to work on as well if, you, if you're not at Hwansing's level, which most people aren't. But the idea is that time, your position gets stronger and stronger over time. Be patient, stay back, and defend. A couple other tips throughout this game is remember if you're Zerg going low tech, if you ever find yourself with a lot of low tech units, you want to be aggressive and trade off those units. And then you make the decision, should I keep reinforcing and maintain being aggressive, or should I transition out of it? Either way, though, you don't want to sit on that low tech army for too long. Then also, of course, um, as a Protoss player, use minimal force fields. Just stay back and defend. Don't try to move out in areas where you have to use a lot of force fields until you're really confident that you have enough units to just totally squash that army. And of course, uh, like I said before, always stay calm and patient. Just stay back and defend. Know when time is on your side. So, and that works both ways. The Protoss player needs to know that if nothing happens for the next couple of minutes, he's going to be way ahead. The Zerg player needs to know that too. And, and, and Ghost User did. That's why you keep being, being aggressive and keep trying to attack. I've seen a lot of Zerg players who will open the style and then sit there. And then Protoss will max out, move out, and win easily with a Protoss Death Bolt against Pure Roach. And the Zerg will be like, God, oh, our army's too strong. Well, it is if you made Pure Roaches. So uh, understand that given your economic situation, your army composition, if times for you or against you, and if you should be aggressive or defensive. Wraps up this uh, third segment. We'll take a short break and be right on to the Q&A.